Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord again. Amen. Amen. Okay, we are so glad to be in the house of the Lord this afternoon. Um, ideally, it should be all youth up here, but maybe I'm young at heart, right? Me and Jeremy both. Amen. So, <laughs> all right, so let's start. Um, to start us off, this is my brother Regan, my sister Beryl, and Jeremy on the, on the keyboard, and my name is Rita. We'll probably ask you to rise up so we can have a, um, a short prayer to start us off. Let's pray. Our dear, kind, and loving Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us life throughout this day. We thank you for bringing us into your sanctuary, Lord, so we can um, hear your word. And even as we start off this moment of worship, we invite your presence that you may inhabit in our praises and take us through to the end for the glory and honor of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll kick off our song service with 610. Stand like the brave, 610. <laughs> stand like the brave. Let's sing 596, look for the way mark. Bye. 
tonight, let's sing 601, Watchman on the Walls of Zion. To 604. 604. We know not the hour.
Good evening. Hey, good evening. Yeah, what I request is uh, our sitting arrangement is quite skewed. Can you can you just come forward? Let's sit here so the pastor can speak to us. Uh, please, those ones at the back, Karibu. Uh, you can come forward. Our church is uh, spacious enough for us to be seated in front here so that we can be able to pray together as, as our family, as our church. Uh, Karibu sana. Thank you. Thank you for uh, agreeing to be obedient and to moving forward. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, friends, mine is this evening uh, to welcome all of us. It's a youth week of prayer. But doesn't mean it's for youth, it's for all of us. I think it's for all of us, uh, although it's led by the youth. So mine is to welcome all of us this evening uh, to worship together, for us to be blessed together as we welcome our speaker for the hour. And I want to thank God for what he's been able to do and I'm sure I'm going to be blessed. I know there are quite a number of people online, and a number of us are online, and therefore I want to also to take this chance to welcome you from wherever you're worshiping, whichever country you are in. Uh, I want to say karibu sana, and may God bless us as we worship together. Uh, we, we want to start our program, and we want to ask all of us stand. We stand with the theme song, 612. And our choristers will take us through. I thought we'd have the corporate prayers. Thank you. Oh, right. 
let's believe and pray our father what in heaven we thank you for the gift of life we thank you for this day for the lord for the lord we have started a week of youth of prayer for the lord we pray that you be with us you guide us we pray that you bless our pastor as he speaks to us let us listen for the lord and take the words into consideration for the lord i pray trusting and believing in the name of jesus christ i pray amen our dear and everlasting master in heaven in addition to the prayers that have been offered we come before your presence at this time lord we thank you for the gift of life we thank you, Lord, for your love and your care that you've uh, bestowed upon us. Dear Lord, we want to pray, even as we are going to start this week of prayer. Lord, may you come and may you send your Holy Spirit to come and be with us. How we pray that, Lord, you may help us and may you answer the, the prayers of your children that they are going to offer during this week. Lord, there are those who are looking for jobs. May you provide for them. There are those who are praying for conducive work environments, Lord. We pray for them, Lord, that may you meet them at that point of need. We also pray, Lord, for those who are sick in various hospitals and in various homes. May you meet each one and every one of them, and Lord, may you give them a testimony so that, Lord, they may stand and know that you are the Lord in their lives. Guide us all through, Lord, and may you help us. We pray even for the speaker, Lord, that you may give him the right words to speak to your children. We pray this, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, we'll read from verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man, limb from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked for alms, and fixing his high eyes on him with John Peter said, look at us. I'll repeat, Acts chapter three, uh, verse one to four. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man limb from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple which is called beautiful, to ask um, from those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter, John, ab about to go into the temple, asked for alms, ask, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter, said, look at us, and may the Lord bless the word. Good evening, church. Good evening, everyone. Someone is being stingy with a smile. It's, it's just a smile. You don't have to be that serious. I hope we all had a good start to the week and that we are ready to face the new week as it has just uh, begun. Thank you, my sister, for reading the scripture for us. We are going to proceed to verse number 11 but uh, we'll be looking at the texts one after the other as we are uh, going ahead. So um, allow me to speak to you on the subject, but Jesus left a church. Just say to your neighbor, but Jesus left a church. Thank you, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we are here that you may speak to us we pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit and that he may drive your word into our hearts. Christianity is very practical. 
and you expect us to do what we learn from your word. Give us the power to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we just read from um, Acts chapter 3. It's a very common passage. Why do we read the book of Acts? These few reasons, plus many others that you may have. What became of Jesus' followers? What then happened to them? If you want to find out, you read the book of Acts. What about the cause that Jesus initiated? What happened to it? Because we know that uh, before he began his ministry, he called the 12th. What happened to that initiative? We also want to find out what was the power behind the acts of the apostles? What is the driving influence that pushed them to do the great works that they did? So reading from uh, the book of Acts chapter 3, we are told that Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. That's about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And then we see another character in verse number two being introduced. And he is referred to as a certain man who was lame from his mother's womb. That is how he is identified. We are not told his name, but he is referred to as a certain man who was born lame. He came out of his mother's womb like that. Nothing happened to him after he had been born, but that's how he came into the world. And as I was reading this, I just thought to myself, okay, fine, this is Luke who is writing. He was a doctor. Maybe he paid attention to these little details. He was interested in how the anatomy of the person he's talking about was arranged. So he quickly picked that. But on the other end, I thought to myself, it could be a problem that we have in the church, that we do not identify each other by who we are, but we identify each other by what we are. We, we, we don't identify each other by who we are, by our names, but we identify each other by our circumstances. The divorced one, the unmarried one, the single mother, the jobless one. But when you read the Bible and you learn from Christ himself, I pray that our churches may be filled with the mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? John chapter 20, Jesus is resurrected and Mary Magdalene is at the tomb. She's trying to find out where her savior is and Jesus speaks to her from behind and he calls her by name. But Mary, the Bible says, Mary thought the man talking to her was a gardener. And so she said, you know what, if you are the one who took my Savior, show me where you put him, I want to go and find him. And then Jesus had to address her, not by her situation, but by her name. He did not, this is the first time you will find Mary Magdalene in the entire scriptures only being called Mary and the Magdalene suffix being removed. I wish I had a witness in the church. Magdalene was just a reminder of who she was. It was a reminder of her situation. It was a reminder of her past. But Jesus is in the business of divorcing people from their past to identify them by whom they have become in him. But alas, the church is always reminding me of who I used to be and who, not who I am at that particular moment. How I pray for the spirit that was in Christ Jesus. That we do not identify each other by our maladies, but we identify each other by who we are, sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are going through difficult times in this life. One person once said, when we come to church, you should know that we all have different experiences. If we are going to say, all of us in here, let's all come and put our problems on the pulpit and let's exchange. You pick the other person's problem, I pick the other person's problem. You know what you would say? I think I'm used to mine. It's okay, I'll just take mine and go. Because you're used to it. 
But we don't have to identify each other by those things. Let's give each other hope. If you are to read in the book of Acts, I never heard the church identifying Peter as the jailed one. But I heard the church praying for the jailed one. Is there someone in this church? That is the spirit of the church. Peter is jailed. People take time out to pray for him the whole night until God hears their prayer and the jail cell is opened and the gates are swung open and Peter walks free. That is the spirit that must reign in the church. And so we see this lame man. Let's get to try and understand him a bit. The man, the Bible tells us that the man is sitting at a gate called beautiful, but there's nothing beautiful about and in his life. And this time, being crippled was not easy. It was not an easy lot. They would actually mock you. If they find out that you have some sort of a problem, they would find something to laugh about. If they would see a stammerer, they would say, can you please sing for us? If they would see a bald man, they would say, please comb your hair. That's what they they used to do. And this man is lame. What they would do is, can you please stand and walk? Let's see how you walk. So it was not easy for this man. And he is expected to contribute to his upkeep by begging. And what they used to say is, before you start begging, go and practice begging at a statue. Go to a statue and practice begging. Why are you supposed to practice begging at a statue? So that you get accustomed to being turned down. So the statue will not talk to you. The statue will not respond. And so that way you will get used to getting nothing out of people. And if they would see a crippled person, they would say that person is a half human being. Just imagine getting into a matatu and you say, I want to pay for two and a half people. It doesn't happen like that, but that's how they looked at people who had maladies. So, The Jewish tradition, you need to understand, it stressed both acts of charity and a high work ethic. That's what they used to do. Be charitable. Give. Especially if you give to the beggars at the temple, that will gain you works of merit. You would be known by God for being charitable. But they also encouraged people to work hard. So to find a beggar, Living on begging, that was the most desperate situation in the land of Jerusalem. And when Josephus is explaining to us the make of the temple, he says there were ten temple gates, okay? And nine of them were overlaid with silver and gold gates. And the other one was overlaid with Corinthian bronze It was so massive that it took 20 men to open or close it. Now, here is a man who is trying to survive, but he is sitting on gold. Ah. I'm I'm getting used to you, and it's working. He is looking for money off people's pockets, but he is looking at gold. And it was not allowed to come with a chisel and a hammer and get a little bit for yourself because tradition did not allow that. There are certain things that are traditional, not scriptural, that we follow at the detriment of humanity. We need to be careful in our church, in our homes, in our families. These things that we uphold, God never asked for that. It's simply tradition, it's cultural heritage, but it's killing humanity. Now, what does Ellen White say about this man? We are just trying to find out more about this man. Acts of the Apostles, page 57, paragraph 2. Ellen White says, This unfortunate man had long desired to see Jesus, that he might be healed. But he was far removed from the sin of the great physician's labors. His pleadings at last induced some of his friends to carry him to the gates of the temple. But upon arriving there, he found that the one upon whom his hopes were centered had been put to a cruel death. This is the situation of this man. 
far removed from the scene of God's action, Jesus' healing action. And finally, he, got, he managed to convince some of his friends to bring him closer. And so they said, this man you are looking for goes to church every Sabbath. So this is what we are going to do. We are going to put you at the temple gate. He will pass by. But he gets there and he finds out the man is dead. How disappointed. How disappointed. But what this man did not know is Jesus had left a church. I wish I had a witness in this church. Jesus had left a church in position to deal with these issues. So I picture this man. He, he had not come to the temple gate to beg. No, he had come for healing. But the fact that he is now begging, he is being told by the people who are taking care of him that we cannot sustain you. Do something for your own survival. And so each and every day, they carried him to this gate, disappointed and shattered, crushed to the bone. He is disappointed and hurt, but he has to take care of himself. But Jesus had left the church. Jesus had left the church. And so we read in Mark chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, that soon after Jesus came down from the all-night prayer he had on the mountain, he started calling disciples one by one, preparing his church. He called Simon and Andrew, preparing his church. He called James and John, preparing his church. Matthew on the other side. Till they were all 12. And Jesus had his church in place. And in Mark chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, we learn that he ordained them. So he organized a church of 12 members. But the man at the temple does not know that Jesus has left a church. Ellen White says, when the father looked upon the scene, while Jesus was ordaining his, uh, let me call them elders, his elders, preparing them for mission, the, uh, Ellen White says, the father looked upon this scene with joy and gladness. Fast forward to Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. Jesus has resurrected and the man is at the gate. If you read your New Testament properly, you will learn that Jesus went to heaven came back and spent 40 days teaching and training his disciples for mission, but he never attended to the needs of his men. He didn't. Why? He had left a church. And so he goes to heaven. He goes to then come back again later for the second time. But then what happens in Acts chapter 2? God pours the Spirit preparing the church for mission. And when the Holy Spirit had been poured, we encounter Acts chapter 3. And what do we see there? Uh, Peter and John, they go to the temple. And when they get to the gate called Beautiful, there is a man there for whom Jesus had left a church. A man who is disappointed, he is probably thinking, okay, so this is going to be my life until I die. But no, it's not going to be his life until he dies. What is the reason Jesus left a church? And so two members of that church look on this man. And as they look at this man, the Bible says Peter fastened his eyes upon him. And he said, look at us, plural. And then he said, silver and gold have I. Look at us, silver and gold I. Follow me closely. Look at us. So he looked both at John and Peter. But when it was coming to the issue of praying for this man, there was no need for more psychology. There, Peter had to stand for himself and say, I don't have. Do you remember when Jesus asked the people and he said, what do people say that I am? And then people said, some say you're Moses, some say you're Elijah, some say this, some say that. And then there came a time when Jesus had to be personal to the disciples. And so Jesus said, what do you say that I am? These issues of getting saved and going to heaven, it's an I issue. Letting sin go is an I issue. 
Taking care of your family is an eye issue. Even if you work with people who teach you not to, taking care of your family, working for your family, being faithful in your singleness or in your marriedness, it's an eye issue. Because it's your own relationship with your own savior. And so they say, silver and gold have I nine. But such as I have, I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The man is now receiving from the church <laughs> what he wanted to receive from Christ. Do I have a witness in the church? So whether Jesus is there or he's not, the church is there to do what Jesus would have done would he be here. This is the reason why we exist as loving tone. To do what Jesus would have done to that orphan if he were here. This is the reason why we exist as a, as a Dorcas Ministries. To do to that widow what Christ would have done would he be here. And so Jesus, when the book of Luke begins, it says, Jesus continues the work he began in his earthly ministry through the church. The book of Luke is all about, it's the book of Luke says, all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And then Acts is about what Jesus continued to do through the church. Are we together? Jesus is still in action. He remains active, but he works through the agent that he chose, and that agent is the church. And I wish to say, I wish there was an orphan listening to me. I would be telling them, but Jesus left a church at Lovington. A widow who is struggling to feed her children, I would wish them to hear that Jesus left a church at Lovington. The reason why we exist as a church is to always show up in the cities. This is where we are. We are not here because it's a mistake. Not because this is where we were given land by the council. I don't know who gives land here. No, that's not the reason. God ordained that this church might be built here to affect the lives of those who are here around. But if I were to ask, perchance, somebody wakes up tomorrow in the morning, calls the entire community of Lovington, and then they say, I am shutting that church down. If we find just one person who will say, don't do that, or else you also kill me, then may God be praised for Lovington. But if there is going to be nobody who is going to say, don't do that, my life is bound up in that church. A pre-Adventist person who is being assisted by this church as they show up in the cities, if nobody raises their hand, then we are yet to start existing as a church. That one is a bit uh, difficult for me to even say. So let's focus on verse number two and let's focus on verse number one. Verse number one says, now Peter and John went up together. If you go back to chapter two, verse 46, you will learn that this was a routine. It was a, a way of doing things. It was a, their habit. But you also notice that there is another routine in verse number two. What is the routine in verse number two? And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily. That one, that one is the routine of the lame man. Huh? So we have two routines. The routine of the lame man and the routine of church members. The lame man is laid at the gate daily. Let's follow the routine of the apostles. It goes way back into the Old Testament. Numbers chapter 28, verse 1 to 8. You may read that. This was the culture. They would go to church for prayers in the morning around nine and in the evening around three. Let me call it the afternoon. They gathered for prayer and priestly blessing twice every day. This is what they were doing. So they go to church in the morning and they go to church in the afternoon for prayers. You will notice that even when Pompey, one of the Roman generals, raided and besieged the Temple Mount, you know that Jerusalem was, a, the, the temple is on a mountain. That's why the Bible says they went up. Okay? So it's, it's, it's high there. It's built on a mountain. So what Pompey did, he came and he sent his soldiers to besiege the entire mount. But even if they were under besiege, 
they never stopped going to church in the morning and in the evening. This is how important this ritual was. Are you following church? And you would be interested to note that this is the very same time that Goliath would rise and mock God and the armies of Israel. First Samuel chapter 17. I wish you were hearing something. <laughs> First Samuel chapter 17, Goliath rises in the morning. And he calls out to the Israelites and he says, is there anyone among you who is brave enough to fight me? Nobody goes. And then around three in the afternoon, is there anyone among you ready to fight with me? Nobody goes. So what Goliath was doing, he was disturbing the prayer time of the Israelites. Ah. And so what he managed to do was to disconnect Israel from their power. And when he succeeded that, the trained soldiers of Israel ran from Goliath twice a day for 40 days. I want to tell you this as this week begins. If the devil manages to make you disconnect yourself from your source of power, you are done. Problems are meant to push you to pray, not to take you away from prayer. If you allow your problems to take you away from prayer, you would rather go into prayer with no words but your heart and your tears than to go into prayer with no heart but just words. I believe God hears. You kneel down, you say nothing, you cry, you rise. You have spoken to your God. I've heard a musician say, tears are a language that God understands. And so, Goliath made sure that he disturbed the prayer time of the Israelites. And so this man's pain is alleviated at prayer time. The church that Jesus had left does exactly what Christ would have done would he be with them physically. But Jesus left a church. So where is the church today? The hungry all around us. Where is the church today? The homeless all around us. Where is the church today? The, those who can't afford to, to send themselves to school. Where is the church to those who lost their husbands or wives? Where is the church? To that single lady who needs parental guidance, but she's far removed from her parents, and yet the church is filled with elderly people who are capable to become a parent to that person. Where is the church? Where is the church? So if you read... Uh, should be Luke chapter 10, you will learn about this man upon whom thieves fell as he was on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho. Somebody commented and said, there are two things that are mentioned in that parable. The first one comes and he passes by. And the second one comes and he passes by. And I pray that Lovington Church is not filled with passers-by. People who see problems in the community and they pass by. That's not what Jesus would do. Jesus left a church so that the church can take care of the problems that they come across. So a certain historian tells us of a story that the Greeks would do. They would race using their boats, using their, uh, their, yeah, their cruising boats, the big ones, those ships. So the boat that would come back after settling for days, they'd go for days, and then you come back, you report that you have arrived to that end, and then you come back. When you are the first to come, your boat would be labeled anti -Pafathen. And for the whole year, your boat will carry that label, and that would gain you prestige among your fellows. Auntie Pafathen, you were the first to come back. Where is the church that Jesus has left? They are busy chasing Auntie Pafathens. The first to drive a cruiser. The first to own such a house. The first to own a flat in Nairobi. The first to have so many degrees or so many academic accolades. The first, we are chasing prestige and recognition at the expense of the mission that Jesus put this church for. Yeah. But I understand this is not good to hear. Jesus has rich friends. Do you know that? He had rich friends. He still has them. 
but you don't amass wealth at the expense of mission or your holiness. No, you don't. Let me ask you a question. What would you want on your dying day? What would you want between these two? Number one, a whole lot of cars, a lot of property, a lot of money in the bank, or 25 people who are looking at you, crying and saying, if it were not for this man, we would not be here. What do you want? Life is all about developing other lives. I want you to go to you on YouTube today, maybe some of you people have seen that, and look for a man called Charles Winton. Charles Winton. And just, just listen, some videos are there, 15 minutes long, some are there an hour long, but you can choose the 15-minute one to save your time. Charles Winton, W-I-N-T-O-N, and you will learn what it means to be alive. And as much as we can gather all these things, if we are not developing other lives, then we are not doing the reason why Jesus left a church. Where is the church today? Councils on Stewardship, page 36, paragraph 1. Where there is life in the church, there is increase and growth. There is also a constant interchange. I want you to listen to this. A constant interchange. Taking and giving and returning to the Lord. That's what life in the church is. Ellen White continues and she says, As he gives of that which he receives, his capacity for receiving is increased. Stewardship in simple terms. The church is supposed to be made up of people who receive from God and return to him. And as they receive from God and continue giving, their capacity for receiving more is increased. Ah. I like this quotation in Testimonies, Volume 4. Ellen White says, God does not want you to die. He wants you to go to heaven. So what he does is, I'm paraphrasing, if he gives you a hundred dollars, how much is your tithe? Ten, and whatever amount your offering is, okay? If you return five dollars as tithe when you received a hundred, you are telling God that a hundred is too much for me. Give me fifty. So what God does is he reduces your income to match your faithfulness your level of faithfulness, so that you make it to heaven. Oh, God loves you so much. So you get a thousand, you give him, you give him 50, you are saying, no, this is too much for me. Give me, give me 500 and I give you 50. It's sad to say, but some of the hardships we are going through, it is because we are not surviving as a church that Jesus has left on earth. Read when you get home. First Samuel chapter 5. You will learn that wherever the holy thing of God goes, there, swift and unerring, the judgments of God will follow. The Philistines took the ark, and they thought they had won. But what happened was their god of stone was decapitated by the four angels that guarded the ark. Thrown down, hands out, head off. And wherever, in the five principal cities of the Philistines, wherever the ark went, men died. Men had diseases. Men had boils. Until they said, let's take this ark and send it back. And that's when disease stopped. Some of these deaths, some of these illnesses, some of this joblessness, some of these problems that we're encountering, it is just God following his holy things. Are we together, church? Now listen to this. On this giving and receiving depend the life of the church. He who receives but never gives soon ceases to receive. You receive, you don't give. So you're also going to cease to... Who has ever continued running water on a full bucket? Who has ever done that? When we see you doing that, we will send you for psychotherapy. Because when the bucket is full, you close the tap. Do you know another uh, the synonym for the word stewardship is the word dispenser? We all know a water dispenser? Yeah. When you are thirsty, 
You go to the water dispenser. You just press. It doesn't ask you, who are you? Where are you coming from? It just gives you the water you want, warm or cold. That's being a steward. When people come asking, you give. Because you've been given to dispense. And when the dispenser is empty, it looks up to get filled again. And when it's full, it looks down. That is the life of... But the problem is, Lovington Church members, some of them have the audacity to divorce that which God said must not be divorced. In the book of Malachi, there are two things that must not be divorced. Number one, husband and wife. Number two, tithes and offerings. We see your tithes envelopes. Where are the offerings? Because through the offerings, we can feed the hungry. Through the offerings, we can build orphanages. Through the offerings, we can clothe the naked. Through the offerings, we can do that which Christ would have done would he be here. Are we together, church? Where is the church that Jesus left? It's hooked on social media and entertainment. People can afford to watch a drama the whole night. These things called series. Guys, please pray. You sit on your couch at eight. You rise tomorrow morning when you are preparing to go to work. You don't even notice. That's the power of entertainment. Somebody can afford to give her television, his television, five hours. But they cannot afford to study the Bible with the neighbor for 40 minutes. Where is the church that Jesus left? Where is the church? Jesus had left. There is someone who is going through a routine of going to a church led by a false prophet, eating grass, lying on the ground, and the prophet stepping on their backs. And they go there every Sunday, but their neighbor is an Adventist who has a whole list of verses on how to identify a true prophet from the false, but they don't have time for that. They have time for Jake Bauer. They have time for Z-World. They even know how to to curse using that kind of a Nigerian, uh, I don't know what you call it. In Zimbabwe, we just say, Kh. but after watching Nigeria, we say, Kh. and it's so long. And now everything you do is just drama. You dress TV, you eat TV, you walk TV. Everything about you is a photocopy. You're no longer yourself. Are we together, church? Yeah, some smiles are disappearing. But we are wasting time <laughs> on what's not important. And yet the song says, rescue the perishing. If Peter and John had not done what Christ expected them to do at the get called beautiful, we would have never read about this man. But his disappointment was turned into joy. His mourning was turned into dancing. His sorrow was turned into happiness. Why? Because the church that Jesus had left did what it was supposed to do. Is the church doing what it's supposed to do? We must show up in the cities. Let me give you a benefit of working for God. Acts of the Apostles, page 105. Strength to resist evil is best gained in aggressive service for God. Were you looking for some, some power to overcome sin? You're looking for some power to drop the other girl and remain with one. Save God. Save God. Get into mission. Spare some time during the week, no matter how busy you are. Just say once every week, for 40 minutes, I am doing a Bible study with that person. And you will see yourself overcoming sin. Because the strength to resist evil is best gained in aggressive service. So if you, have no, if you had no other reason for preaching and witnessing, I've given you one. If you want to overcome sin, then serve God. Serve God. The importance of presence. So Ellen White says in the book called Signs of the Times, yet there will be no one in heaven saved with a starless crown. Huh? We're going to get crowns in heaven. If it is no star, then you are not there. And what does that star represent? If you enter, there will be some soul in the courts of glory that has found entrance there through your instrumentality, your usefulness. We have a department in this church, and it's called the personal ministries, not the congregation ministries. It's personal. You must do something for someone so that they can make it to heaven. 
And if you are here and you are yet to do it, here is a call to repentance. Here is a call to repentance. And so Pope Innocent II and Tom Aquinas here were having a conversation. And as they were talking, the Pope was counting money. And so the Pope says to Thomas, you see, Thomas, the church can no longer say silver and gold have I none because the church now has money. And then Thomas Aquinas said, true, Holy Father, neither can it say rise up and walk. Ah. There is nothing wrong with looking for money. But spare some time to do what you were called for. You are first an evangelist before an engineer. You are first an evangelist before you are a doctor. You are first an evangelist before you are an administrator. And God gave you a job where you are to propagate mission. That's why you are there. Some of you, you will lose your jobs because you have been idle there. Making money and not making mission. So God will say, hey, this one is wasting pace. Let's move him and put another one. So before you are who you are, that helps you make money. You are first an evangelist. That's what you are. Now read verse 8 with me. And he leaning up, stood, walked, and entered with them into the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. How many verbs are in that verse? <laughs> Seven. Let's count them together. Leaping up, Stood, walked, entered, walking, leaping, and praising. I want to tell you something. You have never felt joy until you see someone you worked for coming out of baptismal waters. You have not felt joy. Go ahead and buy the most expensive car in the world. You will not get the kind of satisfaction that you feel when someone comes dripping. <laughs> you know, right now, I, you know, when I, when I learned that I was supposed to come to school, I felt pained because back home in Zimbabwe, we do what we call Zundes. These are evangelistic campaigns. We say for this week, we are going, we can go as far as 500 kilometers away from home with our tents, our food, our PA systems and witnessing teams. We can go there, the 50 of us, the 100 of us. And we camp there. And for those two weeks, no matter how scorching the sun can be or how rainy it can be, we carry our coats and we go into the field, knocking door to door. And when someone tells you, I have decided to be baptized, you have never felt that joy before. You can build the most expensive house, more expensive than the president's, but you have never felt joy until someone has been baptized, whom you have fasted and prayed for. You have never felt joy. But I want to invite you to test this one. Test this one. I want to give you a challenge. Go home, identify a family. Start by just praying to them. I've come, I just want to pray for you. You go. If they don't believe in prayer, invite them for supper. Just start from there. If a person has eaten, a person is defeated. Start from there. Start from the stomach. Build friendship. Pray for them. They'll begin opening up. The reason why you attend a guest day without a guest, it is because you are not in contact with the real world, where you stay or where you work. You busy, turn. Where are the guests? Where are the guests? How come you're looking for guests that other people brought? Where is yours? So verse 8 explains the kind of joy that Peter <laughs> and John witnessed as this man rose up to walk. Opportunities for personal ministries are everywhere. Just that the church, you know, the moment you, 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 you get to work, you plug in your, your earphones and you're on your phone, you're always looking down. But the church of God, it's time to look up and see opportunities for evangelism. Wherever we work, wherever we stay, that is why we are here in the first place. And that is why God has kept you alive up to now. 
So God provides for his glory spontaneous opportunities for ministry and will also grant us the power to seize those opportunities. And some ministry opportunities call on us to determine the real needs of the ones to whom we minister and the resources we have to help them. So to worship God is to maintain contact with the real world. And our service for Jesus begins with self-denial. I'm reading from a book called To Be Like Jesus, written by Ellen White. She says, every Christian will have a missionary spirit. To bear fruit is to work as Christ worked. To love souls as he has loved us. Listen to this part. The very first impulse of the renewed heart is to bring others also to the Savior. Let me put you in a classroom for a moment. When you're studying the Bible, which we call the binary law of opposition or the law of binary opposition. What that means is, if I see two people walking up to me and then I say, the person on the left is looking smart. I have said something about the person on the right without saying anything. The law of binary opposition. The person on the left is looking smart. I have also said, in that very instance, I have said the person on the right is not looking smart. Why isolate one if both are looking smart? Did you get this one? The house on the right is painted well. How about the one on the left? It's not. And the Bible is saying the very first impulse of a renewed heart is to bring others to the Savior. So what is the kind of a heart that doesn't bring others to the Savior? It's not yet renewed. So if, before we even talk about um, anything, the big question is, do we carry renewed hearts? If we did, then nobody would stand here preaching, encouraging us to go and do witnessing and evangelism. No one. Just as soon as a person is converted to the truth, he or she feels an earnest desire that those in darkness should see the precious light shining from God's word. So Neil Armstrong says, it's one small step for men, but a giant leap for mankind. Do one thing where you are, right where you are. You know, I know with this church is in the city and people are busy, but I was challenged one evangelistic campaign, the kind I told you about. They came to my district from a far city. They came to my district where I used to work before I got moved to where I am. And as I was doing an analysis of the people who had come, they were doctors. No, you're not hearing me. They were doctors. They had come to camp for two weeks, turned their backs on needles, and uh, they were teachers, business owners, accountants, professional people. And so I sat them down and I asked, you people are busy. How come you came here? How did you, how did you, and they said, we know that when the year begins, the conference is going to tell us that from August 10 to August 24, there is going to be an evangelistic campaign. So before we apply for our leave days, we first check what the itinerary of the church says. <laughs> and so when we are applying for our leave days, we make sure that our leave days coincide with the campaign, so that we remain with no excuse for not going. The honest truth is, if you excuse yourself from getting involved in mission, you are simply hiding behind your finger. You have no excuse. That's why the Englishman said, where there is a will, there is a way. It just doesn't work in making money. It also works in evangelism. Do you want to do it? I'm talking about the person you spend the whole day with at work, at school, or at home, chatting, and that person is your target market. You have been put there for that person. Maybe some of us are tenants here. We are not homeowners yet. I didn't say we are not homeowners. I said we are not homeowners yet. It's not because that's where you found a flat to occupy. No, that's where God directed you. Do you hear me? He has a reason why he put you there. 
If there is anything you can do for yourself, it's to fulfill the reason why you are where you are. There is a purpose. So there is a difference between saying show up in the cities and showing up in the cities. Is there a difference? Eh? Show up in the cities or showing up in the cities. The best thing that the church can do, I'm about to pray now, the best thing that the church can do is to organize a program for people. But it needs members who don't wait for programs, who are involved in evangelism as a lifestyle. They are involved in giving as a lifestyle. They visit the orphanages as a lifestyle. Do we have people in the church? So the challenge with God is he has members who are program-oriented. They will not go out for witnessing until it's time for a crusade. They will not go to an to a orphanage until the church says we are going on the 22nd of April. They don't. They wait for the program. But it is high time we change our mindset. Let's do these things every day. As long as the Lord provides, let's do what the Lord expects of us. So I shared two routines with you. I'm sharing these with you now as we pray. You come to church every Sabbath. That's your routine. There is an orphan who goes out every day hunting for food. That's their routine. You meet for midweek prayers. That's your routine. There is a widow at some corner crying her heart out because the child has told her, Mama, I'm hungry, and she has no idea how she's going to take that hunger away. That's her routine. There is another one who has a routine, getting confused when standing in front of her walk-in closet. She doesn't know which dress to use. She has to make sure that for the past 30 days, I've never used these. And so she, she gets confused. The reason why some people come to church late, it is not, not because they woke up late. They, they come late because the closet took their time. I put this one, I put it down. I put this one on. You know what that means? You have a lot of them. Give. Uh -huh. I said give. You know when you have one dress, you don't think, which one, what do I wear? You just wash it, you iron it, you get into it, you come to church. Did the pastor say remain with one dress? No. Did the pastor say don't have clothes? No. But I am saying, your routine is to get confused choosing a dress, but someone's routine is to walk around naked. And Jesus left a church to deal with that problem. There is a routine of throwing food away because you are full. But there is an old people's home. Their routine is to write letters looking for donors, and the church is here. You come to church, they go to eat grass at church. There are routines all over. But my question is, when Jesus was ordaining the 12, God was smiling in heaven. My question is, when we walk through the gates and the doors of Lovington Church, is God smiling? Oh, his heart is elsewhere, but his people are in here. So there's a difference between showing up in the cities and just show up in the cities. Showing up is called the present participle. Showing, it's present and continuous. Huh? It just doesn't happen once on global day, and that's it. It continues. To happen, But the church cannot keep on organizing those programs. The church members must organize those programs as small groups, as families, as individuals, as friends, as amo. And they go and they deal with the problems that Jesus would have dealt it. Would he be here? My plea for the church today is that we stop making evangelism an event. Stop making giving an event. It must be a lifestyle. Are we together, church? So let's end with this. If I say loving to an SDA church, you say showing up in the big cities. Okay. And if I say the opposite, you also do the opposite. Loving to an SDA church? Showing up in the big cities? May God bless you.
we would like to invite the choristers for the closing song. 612. sing this song. for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight's service. Thank you for speaking to us. We pray that as we go out, we may think upon these things and act upon these things so that at the end, Jesus may say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the kingdom of your Father. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Uh, good evening. I'd like to thank uh, uh, the preacher for allowing the Lord to use him mightily this evening. And uh, I'd like to also thank you all for coming, for showing up. And we purpose to show up in the cities, right? To, we, we purpose to be showing up, yeah? It's a continuous uh, practice, and not only today or during the GYE. So uh, serving up front uh, was uh, the corporate prayers were offered by Vincent and Agnes. We had the scripture reading from Eva, and uh, of course, our pastor. And uh, the elder on duty was Elder Nyamota, and uh, I was also assisting in the program, I'm Melissa. So uh, we have come to the end of the evening, and we'd like to invite you tomorrow, uh, the whole week. It will be starting from 5.30, not 4.30 like today. Uh, during the week, it will be beginning from 5.30 to 7. And uh, we'd like you to come with a friend. Come with a friend, uh, whether it's a youth or just all of us, because it's a week of prayer. It's only led by youth, but then all of us are involved, right? Yeah, so uh, let's uh, rise up for the words of grace uh, before we uh, leave. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you, and may God bless you as you go to your homes. Amen. See you tomorrow.